Um, something that I've realised in most churches, um, you hear things preached about marriage, but you hardly hear anything preached about how to be single and how to serve God whilst you're single. And um, singleness is treated like a disease and marriage is the cure to it. So of course I need to say some things, don't I? Um, so my sermon title is, these are the things I wish I knew. Um, I've had the devil in my ear all week. Um, because I'm going to talk to you about singleness and I really didn't want to talk, talk on it because I've kind of felt discouraged to speak about it because obviously I'm married now, right? So I'm going to talk to single people about the benefit of singleness. But God told me that I'm more than qualified to speak on this. Why? Because I've been single, I've done it wrong, I've done it right, so I can share some stuff from experience. Um, and single people can't be the only ones to qualify to speak on this matter. matter. I believe that people who are a bit single and have moved on to the next chapter have a lot to say about it. Um, here's something just that I'm going to give in introduction to this message. Um, I realised that when I discovered my purpose, I realised why singleness was important. Yeah, when you discover purpose, you know who's suitable for you and who you want to bring into that purpose. So what's our purpose? From Genesis to Revelation, our whole purpose is to glorify God in everything that we do. Amen. Yeah? And if you know glorifying God is your purpose, it narrows down your field of vision for who your spouse is. Mm. And you can begin to ask yourself, who can I bring into my life to help me glorify God? Who can I bring into my life to help me fulfill that purpose? Right? right? So it's impossible to talk about marriage without talking about purpose. Someone say purpose. Yeah. Every single man is built for the purpose of their woman, and the reverse is true. Rome is built for me. Rona can handle the fact that I'm a pastor. Not many people can handle that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Rona was crafted for me as I was crafted for her. And she, if, if she wasn't crafted for me, then that means that we weren't together for a purpose. Am I making sense? So that would mean that we'd have different convictions. Now imagine if I was convicted about the church and Rona wasn't. Imagine how, how different our old views would be. Imagine if she saw everything that I'm doing right now as long, but the fact is she doesn't. Why? Because we have the same convictions. If we didn't have the same convictions, then we won't have the same vision. So your conviction brings birth to vision. What you're convicted about gives birth to your vision. Your conviction is why you don't quit. Your conviction is why you study. It's why you say yes. It's why you sacrifice. And if Rona wasn't crafted or an equal yoke to me, my conviction with this church would be an enemy to her on a daily basis. She'd be at war with my conviction. Therefore, it's important that you sink your teeth into purpose before you get into a relationship. Because there's going to be a time when I'm feeling low and I need to be energized. I need to retreat some energy from Rona and I need support from an understanding spouse. I need someone who will support me and not feel at odds with my purpose. Am I making sense? So it's dangerous to marry without purpose. Someone say purpose. It's not until both people in the relationship are moving in purpose that you've re you realize why you actually need each other. Sex is great, but there has to be more than that. Cooking is great, there has to be more than that. Being a good parent is great, but there has to be more than that. You can do all of that as an unbeliever. So what's the point? So the point is we have to understand the purpose behind the relationship because the worst marriages are the marriages without purpose. All right, let me ask you a question. What do you think the key is to a healthy relationship? Throw some things out. Christ and Christ and being on time. Alright, good. <laughs> Do you know what's good about it? What I didn't hear is love. And most people would say that the key to a healthy relationship is love. But love isn't enough to anchor anything. Yeah. And that's a very controversial statement. Exhibit A. How many people did you think you loved before the person you're with right now? <laughs> How many careers did you love before the place you're working at right now? One house, one house. So you loving something isn't enough to energize your commitment to remain in it. And I'm using love lightly here, but love isn't the key to a healthy relationship. The key to a healthy relationship is understanding. Someone say understanding. understanding. It's what you understand about your partner. First Peter 3, 7, let's look at it. It says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. So husbands have to understand something about their wives. And if you don't understand your wife, or if you don't even understand women, you can't be a good husband. The reverse is true. Wives must understand their husbands. 
We, both, we must both come to a place of understanding. And understanding doesn't mean agreement. If I can understand why you come to the conclusions you come to, if I can understand why you see the world that you see it, why you respond to certain things, it means that I've explored you enough mentally and I can see the world through your lens. So if I don't agree with you, I can now empathize because I now understand. I don't have to agree, I don't have to like it, but I can see why you reached your conclusion. And understanding is what brings intimacy. Without understanding, you can't truly be intimate. When you're in a relationship and you say we're getting to know each other, what you're saying is we're getting to understand each other, we're coming to a point of understanding. And so intimacy is born through understanding each other. You can love me, but if you don't understand me, if you don't understand the, with the way I was raised, the way I think, our relationship is going to be built on misunderstanding, mm. assumptions. And when you feel misunderstood, what do you feel? Lonely. Yeah. How many of you have been in a room full of people and felt lonely before? Raise your hands. So you can see that loneliness isn't the absence of people. Loneliness is the absence of understanding. And many people in relationships don't feel understood. And so they feel lonely. And the danger of being misunderstood is it ruins your physical intimacy. Don't touch me. I'm going for a walk. And we can still love each other when we say those things. But if we don't understand each other, it breaks the intimacy because we're not emotionally intimate. We're not mentally intimate. And so because my emotions can't follow this, my body can't even open up to you. That's when the affirmation begins to stop. I stop affirming you. And here's the thing, you need to talk because no one should affirm your spouse more than you. You should leave no room for the enemy. And affirmation is the byproduct of what? Understanding. Someone say understanding. And to get understanding, you have to communicate. So communication is the key to understanding. Therefore, communication is the key to a healthy relationship. And the issue is we want intimacy, but we don't want understanding. And understanding comes from having honest conversations. And an honest conversation means sometimes there's going to be inevitable conflict. And conflict is necessary. A, a, lot, a lot of stuff in our relationship has to be talked through. We can't be silent. And I don't think relationships are as honest as they need to be. We start protecting each other's feelings so we don't talk about things. And you can either be honest and it will either mend your relationship or end your relationship. But you have to be honest. Because conflict should educate you. The point of an argument isn't to remain the same. The point of an argument is to create an opening for you guys to review something so you can both understand. Conflict should, should produce understanding which brings, brings you closer together. But if conflict means that you become less close and means that you run and no one wants to understand, then that means that you're not actually doing conflict wrong. Conflict, conflict should actually educate you. If you have to compromise who you are in order to keep peace, it's probably the wrong relationship for you. If you both can't talk to each other, then who do you talk to? Are you hearing me? So marriage isn't for the self-absorbed. Self marriage isn't for the emotionally unavailable or immature. Adulting is required for marriage. Turn to Titus 2, verse 3. Things I wish I knew. Understanding is necessary as a foundation for a relationship because two upbringings become one. I might like to eat my food and be on my phone. Ro Rona might have lived her life sitting down at a table talking with her family. If I was eating my, my food inside my bedroom and Rona grew up eating her food at the table, she's going to think I'm rude because I'm on my phone or something. Whoa. She's going to think I'm rude. And if she doesn't explore my mind enough, she's going to think this guy is rude. All she has to do is ask a question. Understanding two upbringings become one. Look at the scriptures. Titus 2, 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Older women are to teach and train young women to love their husbands. Likewise, older men are to teach and train the young, young men how to love their wives. This means that you have to be trained and taught about relationships. So if you're not in the school of becoming a better wife or a better husband, then your chances of having a good marriage is slim. And that's for people in marriage and people who aren't married. You need to be taught about relationships. 
Women must be taught about men, and they shouldn't be taught about men from a woman. And men should be taught about women, and they shouldn't be taught about women from men. We don't understand each other. Rona and I represent different perspectives, different thought patterns. God created me to think a way and women to think a different way. And so I can't make a woman think like a man. And women, you can't make a man think like a woman. We go silent. You might want to talk, we go silent. We're inside processing. You don't like to talk through things. So that means that we have to learn each other. Otherwise, you're going to treat me like your girlfriend. <laughs> and so one of the first lessons that we have to have before relationships is the lesson about being okay with being single. And so this lesson isn't about you looking for the right one, but you becoming the right one, amen? Right, let's get into this. So I'm a bit tired, I went to sleep very late last night. All right, here's a quick look. Did you know that there are single people who want to be married? Just raise your hands if you do that. All right, right, check this out, check this out, check this out. Check this, check this. Did you know there are married people who want to be single? Let that deliver you. Let that deliver you. You think marriage is easy? Okay. I want to relieve you of some pressures. This culture has this idea that if you're 25 plus and single, you're a widow. Yeah, that's like true. you failed in life. It's true. It's true. And they don't have people come up to you saying, where is your husband? It's true. And they tell you to not get in a relationship until you're 19, and by the age of 21, you should be married with babies. <laughs> and so it's one extreme. Don't talk to boys, and then it's the other extreme. Where's your babies? And now I'm mad awkward. I don't know how to flirt. Do you understand what I'm saying? So people will make you feel like having a spouse is necessary for your survival. So you don't even realize it, but you've been conditioned to need someone. And then the Western cultures, let's just say that's the African Eastern culture, yeah? That's the, do you understand? <laughs> All right, cool, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and then the Western culture, the Western culture will tell you don't get married until you can afford to get married. Yes. If you can't afford marriage, don't do it. Once you make it, then you can add a relationship to your list. So once you get a mortgage, then you can marry. Talk about it. You may never have a mortgage. You may never have a mortgage. Never. So what you have is a gang of men trying to do this thing alone so they can make it and be successful before marriage. And what you have is a, have is a gang of women who feel like if they're not married, they're a failure. And this culture is so glorified sex. That it makes single people feel that singleness is, is, is a disease. But singleness isn't a disease. The Bible actually calls singleness a gift. Come on. I'm going to prove it. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm ready for you guys today. I'm feeling my health right now. Alright, as you turn to 1 Corinthians 7, let me give you context. In 1 Corinthians 5, do I even say this? There's a guy who's speaking with his mother in law. So that's 1 Corinthians 5. It has to do with sex. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Shall I join my body with a prostitute? No. He says, If I join my body with a prostitute, I become one flesh with her. So 1 Corinthians 6 is dealing with the topic of fornication. Yeah? And Paul's addressing believers in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. He's addressing believers who think meaningless sex is okay. But here's what's deep. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's addressing another set of believers who believe that sex should be avoided even in marriage. So, if you look at 1 Corinthians 7, watch this. This is just context. Look at it. It says, now concerning the matters in which I you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with women. So one side of the church believe they should get their urge out with prostitutes. And the other side of the church think even if you're married, you shouldn't have sex. So Paul's writing to a divided church here. This is why he says, if you're married, don't deprive one another of sex unless of a time of fasting. All of that's context for 1 Corinthians 7 where we're starting. And that's necessary because the, the single believers are sleeping around and the married believers aren't sleeping with each other. So he realizes single believers need help and married believers need help. And so we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Then we're going to expand it in verse 32. 
First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. All right, how are you? Single. Yeah, single. <laughs> but each has his own, what's that word? Yeah. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. All right, so I wish you were as I am. Each one has his own gift. Watch this. To the unmarried and widows, I say that it is good for them. Read it again. To the unmarried and widows, I say it is good for them to remain single as I am. This is why we know Paul was single. So Paul says there's this thing I have called singleness and it's a gift. And it's good if you remain single. He then says each has his own gift from God. One of one kind and one of another. To quickly explain what these gifts are, he's saying singleness is a gift. Celibacy is a gift. And marriage is a gift. Meaning there's benefit in being single. There's benefit in being celibate, which means you actually, you, to the end of your days, nobody. And there's benefit in being married. To the unmarried and widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single as I am. So why is it good to remain single? Why is singleness a gift? Because I want to be in a relationship. What's so good about being single? If singleness is a gift, can I have a refund? I don't want it. But here's why it's a gift. When you're single, you have time to do things that people wouldn't have time for when, they, when they're married. You can have your boys over whenever you want. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to consider another person's feelings. You don't have to buy them gifts. You don't have to let them know where you are. <laughs> but when you're married, everything changes. You now need to be in rhythm with the other person. Your money is now their money, it's not yours. Your job hours now affect them. You have to check in with your spouse to see if they're okay. You can't just get up and travel. You have to sit down, plan and budget, and then maybe you can go. <laughs> so the single person, the single person's decisions only affect them. But the person in a relationship, their decisions now affects the person they're with. Yeah. And so married life is more complicated and singleness is more straightforward. So singleness is a gift. And marriage is a gift. And the biblical perspective on singleness is that singleness is not inferior to marriage. Yeah. Yeah. It is not inferior to marriage. A married person is not better than you. Marriage doesn't cure loneliness, marriage exposes loneliness. Wow. A married person isn't better than a single person. It's better to be single and happy than married and miserable. I'm coming, don't worry, I'm coming. Singleness is a gift because it allows you to discover who you are, appreciate who you are, and acknowledge who you are. And from that place, you can now love and appreciate others. So the most important pursuit you have in life is self-knowledge, and that's what singleness is about. Singleness is about you finding yourself, loving yourself, valuing yourself, accepting yourself, understanding yourself, appreciating yourself so much that you can share yourself with someone else. And I'm not discouraging mar marriage at all here. I'm not discouraging relationships at all. I just want to lift the burden off of people who think if you're single, you have a problem. Yeah. You don't have a problem, you have a gift. You have a gift. You can do a lot without the added pressure of a relationship. So, you can either view the gift of singleness as a prison or a passport. If singleness is a passport, you can travel, you can take every opportunity you want, you can do missions, you can do whatever you want, there's freedom. If singleness is a prison, then you're gonna settle for anyone that comes back. Because you view a relationship as something to rescue you. So please rescue me. Rescue me from this prison. So you're gonna settle because anyone who's interested in you is an opportunity to bail you out of prison. And that's because some people see themselves as incomplete without a partner. Yeah. Yeah. But a relationship doesn't com complete you. Yeah. Yeah. You should be complete without a person. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. It's true. Do you know how completeness comes? By you honoring singleness. How many more relationships do you have left in you? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, listen. You shouldn't be so lost. You shouldn't be so love starved that you have to go and grab anyone just to say you have someone. Yeah? That's true. Paul acknowledges this in 1 Corinthians 7 8. Watch this. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. People use the scripture all the time, it's so mature. I'm going to read it again. But if they cannot exercise self control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So he says, if you're tempted and you're stuck in temptation, it's better to marry. So Paul gives you options. If you can't control yourself, get married. Is that a good foundation for marriage? No. It's not God's best for you. A marriage should not be built on the foundation of temptation. A marriage built on the need for sex is not a great foundation. Your sex drive is going to change one day. Sex cannot be the foundation for marriage. And no one in history has ever died because they didn't have sex. <laughs> what happened to John? He's a virgin. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Listen, a lot of people get into relationships because of lust. A lot of people get in relationships as medicine to heal themselves. People get in relationships for help. But God doesn't send your spouse to be your deliverer. They're your spouse, they're not your saviour. No one should have to go through emotional abuse trying, in the name of Jesus, trying to be Jesus to you because you're too childish and too arrogant and too, and too proud to admit that I'm not ready. Am I making sense? And that's one of the most important things you can admit. I am not ready. I asked the question in the group chat this week, would you marry yourself? I don't want to hear Missy's answer. <laughs> would you marry yourself? If you knew everything about yourself, would you marry you? Would you marry yourself with your bad habits? Picking your nose. <laughs> Not putting on deodorant. Not even scrubbing out the toilet. Would you marry yourself? Would you? You guys, you look, look. We look nice in public. Would you marry yourself knowing what you look like at 2 in the morning? Wow. 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 I know, it sounds shallow. Right? But I want, I want to like the person I look at. I, look at, I want to like them. <laughs> Would you marry yourself? And the person, the person that I'm with, I want to enjoy marry, marriage with you for the next 70 years. Can you prepare yourself for that? Could you live with yourself for the rest of your life? And I think most people can't handle that. That's why they want someone. You can't live with yourself. It's too much for me. I have to share this mess with someone. Singleness is a gift. And will your singleness be a gift to someone or a curse to them? Because your singleness is exposed in marriage. What you did not do in singleness will be exposed. And I know singleness can be hard, don't get it twisted, but it's necessary. Recognize the season you're in and allow it to transform you. And if you can accept singleness as a gift, the season of singleness will be so much easier to embrace for your personal development. Let me prove it to you a bit more. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. <clears throat> the Bible reads, Paul, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. Paul says that being single makes you more eager to serve God and please God. I'm going to read it one more time, just so you get it. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. So the unmarried man is anxious about God. Before I even go there, single people have a flexibility and their lives are less complex. And so if you say, I have no time for God, you actually have no excuse. Some of you work from home. You probably don't pay any bills. You're not a parent. You don't have to ask the kids if they brush their teeth. You don't have to check their homework. You don't have to see if they've eaten. 
You don't have to give them cow poll. You have time to serve God, you're single. I know single people who run home ministries, hundreds of people and they're working full time. I know single parents who still do ministry. And I need to speak about single parents as well, I'm not overlooking you. But my point is, if you're single, your job is not an excuse to not serve God. The unmarried man is anxious about pleasing the Lord. I'm sorry, your job is not an excuse. And if work is why you don't read your Bible, you're placing a worldly thing above God and that's an idol. So I have to speak to the laziness of single believers who have time on their hands. I know you can be tired from work, don't get me wrong. I know work can be long, but you can still speak about the gospel to your family members if you can't make it to church. You can still serve. Do something. Do something. We make so many excuses to not, to not serve God. So it's me first, then God. It's not God first, then me. And then we cry when God doesn't show up for us. I'm hitting this home. He's saying the single person is not distracted, but they're anxious about pleasing God, meaning they're anxious about serving God. My question to you single people, ask yourself, am I anxious about pleasing God? Am I anxious about serving God or am I anxious about getting in a relationship? Where do your anxieties lie? And that's gonna reveal the compromise of your heart. That will, that will reveal the level of idolatry that you're at. And I'm not saying that wanting a relationship is bad, I'm saying watch out for idolatry. If you're single, you should be the first one ready to serve God. That's using your singleness. That's maximizing your singleness. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 7, 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Notice that the unmarried man is anxious about serving the Lord, but the married person is anxious about their relationship. So both stages has anxiety. Marriage has anxiety, singleness has anxiety. Singleness, you're anxious about God. Marriage, you're anxious about your, your spouse. Both cases has anxiety, so not one case is greater than the other. So when you're single, you can do what you want. But once you're married, you have to start thinking about date night. If a man's single, he doesn't need to think about the house. Truth be told, if I was single for the rest of my life, I wouldn't care about getting a big house. I wouldn't care about getting a big car. I wouldn't care about those things, I'd do a bachelor, seriously. But once you get married, your interests are divided. And that's not a bad thing. And the, the married man becomes concerned about worldly things. That worldly things isn't ungodly things, he's talking about material things. The married man becomes anxious about material things, how to please his wife. The married man wants to create an atmosphere that is safe for his wife. How? Through the, through the mortgage, yeah. through the provision. Wife comes first. She comes before PlayStation. She comes before I go out with my boys. If it's a cold day, I give her my coat. She comes first. She even comes first with the wedding. As a man, I don't care about the extravagant extravagance of the wedding. I don't care about the aesthetics. I don't care about the dancers. I don't care about the fruit table. I don't care about the guest book. As far as I'm concerned, we can go to the registry and call it a day, as far as I'm concerned. The big wedding is for the woman. I'm sorry, you guys need to hear that. It's for the woman. But the man wants to please his wife even if she, if she isn't his wife yet. So let, let's put on this big show to make you happy. So the married man is anxious about worldly things. Sorry, the, un, the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And the unmarried man is anxious about the things of God, how to please God. So this isn't just the husband's duty to please his wife. Because we've seen it. The, unmarried, the married woman, sorry, is anxious about pleasing her husband. So it's not just the husband trying to please his wife here. It's her duty trying to please him. So both people in the marriage have a responsibility to serve each other. Not one person is doing all the work in this. The relationship is the relationship's going to collapse. So we have to serve one another willingly. That's what brings health to the relationship. So the married person's duty is to first please God. Am I in this church? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The married person's duty immediately shifts once he's married. Now it's about pleasing their spouse. 
In other words, Rona becomes my first ministry. And I become her first ministry. I have to love her as Christ loved the church. And that's how a lot of pastors fail. They see the church as their first ministry. But Rome is my first ministry, you look and show. Do you know what the Bible says? A man who does not lead his house well is worse than an unbeliever. So clearly, a man and a pastor, I have a duty to my wife first. No amount of work, no amount of ministry should overshadow her. She shouldn't be fighting with my work. So I have to consider my wife before I make decisions. I can't be careless now and, and, and go to jail for the gospel. That's not being considerate of her. I could have done that when I was single. Now I've got a wife. Let me do something. Sorry. You guys know. I'm sorry. Please do me a favor. And please, don't lie. Please stand in this room if you're single. And when I say single, yeah. <laughs> his wife. The unmarried person is anxious about pleasing the Lord. So if the married man's interests are divided because he's, he's focused on pleasing his wife and the wife is the first ministry, then according to this text, every single person in this minute, in, in, every single person in this room should have a ministry that's more impactful than a married person. Did you hear me? There's married people still serving the Lord despite being married and their interests are divided and they're doing a lot for God. Single people, you have more time. A married person should not be out serving you. Single people should be out evangelizing, changing the world, turning the world upside down. That's why singleness is a gift. God's given you a gift, an ability to do so much for you. And single people are the most impactful demographic in the church. I'm trying to tell you to not waste this season of your life. You have a gift that gives you the ability to do more for God than people in relationships. I know this series is about relationships and whatnot. I'm going to speak on that. But there's purpose in your singleness. And I don't want you to miss it. And I'm not trying to stimulate you into staying single. I'm not. I'm just trying to show you why singleness is impactful. I'm trying to make you understand how God sees singleness. Look at it this way. In singleness, you get a level of self-control, discipline, and preparation that you wouldn't get in a relationship. In singleness, you can work on your character, your communication skills, your listening ability, your emotional restraint, financial stewardship, and you can start to come into yourself. In other words, in singleness, you'll refuse to settle because you've worked too hard to get to this place to allow someone who doesn't fit to be a part of your life. Come on. You've discovered your, your purpose first before you got in a relationship. You didn't rush into a marriage blind with someone who doesn't fit. So I'm going to hit you with an equal yoke. The only way you can know if you're equally yoked with someone is if you're running as fast as you can. And when you hit top speed, you look over and see who's able to keep up with you. That's the person you marry. Run after God with all your heart and look at who's keeping up. That's the person. It's them. Not the person who's slowing down. You need the equal. You don't need to tolerate, you don't need to settle. You have to marry someone who is your equal. You have to get with someone who helps you glorify God in your marriage. Not someone who's a distraction to your ministry. You have to get with someone who's an asset to your ministry. Someone who promotes you, not someone who demotes you. So don't rush into the wrong situation because it's better to be single than married and miserable. And if two people have a bad relationship, it doesn't mean they're two bad people, it just means that they're bad for each other. If you get with someone who's unequal, then you're not really their spouse, you're their mentor. Let me, let me explain. 
If you as a woman think it's okay to get dropped home at three in the morning by another guy, then we're not equal. We don't understand each other. If I have to go out of my way to explain why it was wrong for you to get dropped, at fr dropped home at three in the morning, we're not equal. We're not equal mentally, we're not equal emotionally, we're not equal spiritually. I should not be at odds with you over that little issue. Am I making sense? Or we argue over the most pettiest things. If I'm your teacher in a relationship and you're my student, did you know there's laws against student-teacher relationships? Did you know you can go to jail for that? <laughs> no, watch me. That's what an unequal yoke is. An unequal yoke is a prison sentence. When you date evangelistically, it's a prison sentence. They're not your project. You're not their architect. Stop getting with broken people to fix them. Who told you to go on www.buildaspouse.com? You're going to lose your mind trying to make this relationship work. So rather than running about, rather than worrying about a relationship, run as fast as you can with God. Maximize your singleness with God. Because when you're single and you serve the Lord, God allows you to find yourself. Then you find fulfillment and then your taste buds change. Your taste buds change. God conforms you to his image. He transforms you. And when he's transforming you, he's transforming your thinking. And when he's transforming your thinking, he's changing your eyesight so you can see clearly. And when you see clearly, you won't walk into a trap. But you won't walk into a trap when you can see clearly. You have to allow God to conform you. Right? And the issue is so many of us are walking into traps because we don't allow God to do what he needs to do in singleness. You will be able to see who is wifey material and who isn't. You'll see who's husband material and who isn't. But that comes through being practical. That comes by getting out of the house, not expecting the man to come and knock at your door randomly. Do something. Come on. Go out. Go and have fun. Come on. Serve God. Come on. Do something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so tired, so I might just look like I'm frustrated. I'm not. <laughs> Proverbs 18.22, the Bible says... He who finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor with the Lord. All right, let me help you. How does, how does a man find a wife before she's a wife? Because before you're found, you have to be a wife, right? We know this. So before approaching her, I have to be a husband, right? So in other words, you have to mimic the characteristics of a wife or a husband. But that leaves room for, like, that's very vague. How do you do that if you're single? How do I mimic the characteristics of a wife or a husband whilst I'm single? Am I supposed to act like their wife and give them all the wifey benefits before commitment? No. Remember what I said last week, there's no dating in the Bible. That means you aren't cool to be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Did you hear what I just said to you? You should actually be the worst boyfriend or the worst girlfriend in the world. I know that sounds mad. You should be, because you weren't cool to date. You are cool today. There's certain conversations you can't have with me. Right. There's certain boundaries you can't cross. You should be the worst boyfriend or girlfriend in the world. Right. Because you were cool to be a friend, sister, or wife. Yeah. You were cool to be a friend, brother, or husband. Yeah. You are cool to be someone's babe. Yeah. You are cool to be someone's friend with benefits. Yeah. Every single one of you should be in the friend zone. <laughs> I speak the friend zone over you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Is that your calling, professional girlfriend? 
I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna say something right now. Yeah, you should not be dating for years yeah. and there be no intention to marry. How? How can you have three anniversaries and there be no intention towards marriage? It's a long time to not cross boundaries with each other. So I need to understand that you guys are fornication. Stop wasting time. Stop experimenting. Stop knocking about. And if you're not intending to it, leave them. Let someone who's serious come along. Stop shooting them along. You're no one's professional boo. You're worth more than that. Jesus said you're faithfully a wonderful mate. He thought you were worth dying for. So who do you think you are wasting our time? The Bible says he who defines a wife, that's a woman with standards. A woman who says you're not crossing that line. You're not getting marital blessings before marriage. I'm not paying your bills. I can buy you dinner. I can get you a gift. But you're not going to have access to certain parts of me until we're married. That's not your calling. You're no one's side piece. Am I too kitschy? So how do you become a husband or wife before marriage? The Bible says that Jesus is our husband and we're the bride of Christ. Man, that's you as well. So there are ways to develop traits as a person before you become a husband or wife. How? By making Jesus your husband, so you respond to him like the bride of Christ. Now that sounds weird, man, and we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> Let me speak to the women. When a man finds you, he should find the attributes of a wife already. Not a desperate woman who needs a saviour for her loneliness. You have a saviour. Jesus. And so a spouse can't save you. A spouse can't make your life better. Marriage doesn't make your life better. You make marriage better. You make marriage better. Because marriage exposes what you bring to the table. Mm. So if you have good in you, then you're going to bring good to the marriage. If you have bad in you, you're going to bring bad to the marriage. The institution of marriage isn't going to make you happy. You as a person make marriage what it is. So get out of the club, please. Stop sleeping around. Deal with your porn issues. It's time to learn the Bible. Do what the Bible says. Don't be hearers only, be doers. Man, don't get your fingers up. All right? The worst thing in the world is an indecisive man. A man who can't stick to his decisions. It's the worst thing. If you can't lead yourself, you can't lead a woman. It's time for you to have undivided devotion to God. And that's preparation without you realizing it. God completes you. And because God completes you, you are now prepared for a relationship. So let me tell you, this is how you know that you're prepared for marriage. When you don't need one. When you have to find your happiness in marriage, you're a dangerous person. <laughs> have you ever heard that before? Yeah. When you find your happiness, joy, and contentment in God first, and you find your needs in God, that's when you're ready. If you think anything else in life will make you content, you have the wrong foundation, period. Because as I said, there are single people who want to be married, and married people who want to be single. And so it's better to be patient and accept being single than being anxious and regretting that you got married. Some married people are sucking each other's blood right now, it's crazy. Vampires, biting and devouring each other. Can't talk, can't commit. Do you want what you want? Do you even know what you want? Turn to Matthew eleven sixteen. 16. My last point, I'm coming down. You should ask yourself why you want to be married. And loneliness isn't a good enough answer. Matthew eleven sixteen. 16. Watch what Jesus says. But to what shall I compare this generation? Let me put it on you guys. But to what shall I compare this generation? It says, it is like children sitting in the marketplaces. Basically saying, this generation is like children having businesses. This generation is like children being influential. To what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in marketplaces and calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you, 
and you did not dance. We sang a dirty and you did not mourn. This generation is like playing dress up for weddings. Getting money to stunt on each other. Doing things to look good to others, then getting offended when you don't get, don't, don't get likes. I uploaded on Instagram, you didn't like it. I saw your wedding, I didn't get any invite. Boo hoo. It cost a lot to have a plate of food at a wedding. And just because you're their friend on Instagram doesn't mean you get an invite. You gave nothing to it, you're offended. This generation is like children in the marketplaces. We did this and you did not do this. We did this and you did not do this. Stunting, stunting on each other. Spending over 40k on weddings. Children. The point I'm making is single people want to be married because of lifestyle. Big, big, big weddings. Preparing for the wedding day, not preparing for the marriage. Childish. And someone has to call you into maturity. I don't care what age you are. Age doesn't equal maturity. Having white hairs doesn't make you mature. Right. A proposal, a diamond ring, an expensive wedding, a beautiful honeymoon. That's fantastic. But it's not a marriage. Yeah. Marriage isn't the whole the goal in life. That's right. I know it's rich coming from someone who's married. But I promise you, before I got married, I was okay with not getting married. I love the fact that I'm with my wife. But I was on full blown eunuch vibes. And then God brought me Rona. Maybe. I didn't need Rona. I wanted Rona. I don't need Rona to live. I want Rona to live. There's a difference. If I needed her, then I'll pull her into a maternal role and I don't want to marry my mom. <laughs> Marriage isn't the being one end all. Marriage is just a picture of Christ in the church. And did you know in heaven there's no marriage? Which means marriage isn't eternal. There is no marriage in heaven. So marriage is a temporary gift on earth. Matthew 22, 30, if you want to go to it. That means when I get up there, there's no marriage. Do you know what that means? Rona will just be a friend to me. I know, babe. I know. <laughs> but marriage is not going to carry over into eternity. My point is, marriage is a gift to fulfill a purpose on earth. Singleness is a gift to fulfill a purpose on earth. The gift of singleness is given to conform you to the image of God in that season. Mm. And when you get married, it is a gift to conform you to the image of Christ in that season. Mm. God is now using Rona to conform me. Mm. Prior to that, he was using self-control and singleness to conform me. It is a gift. Mm. And how you view it will determine how you embrace it. Mm. So as I close, singleness is the most important stage of your human development. Adam was born single, then a relationship came. So it's important you focus on singleness and try not to create relationships without first building who you are in God. The most important people in this room right now are the single people because they can do more for God. And so my, encour my encouragement is you tap into what it means to be single. Maximize your singleness. And if you don't need to be married, then you're ready for marriage. You're the perfect candidate for marriage. But, if you need somebody, you're not, you're dangerous. Not needing marriage means that you're whole. You're having a good life all by yourself, that's wholeness. I don't need somebody, I'm somebody by myself. I don't need you to prove me, I know what I bring to the table. But if you need marriage, you're dangerous. I've been waiting for you all my life. I don't need that level of pressure. <laughs> I'm going to say something because, listen, see, you see the one doctrine, I'm actually closing, you see the one doctrine, you know it's not biblical, do, did you know that, do, do you find the one mentioned in the Bible, do you see it there, but because we've been so indoctrinated by Cupid and romantic movies, we've mixed it all of our faith, and when someone says the one isn't a thing, we want to hold on to our romantic doctrine so we fight against it. 
The one is dangerous. Once you get with that person, like I said last week, domestic violence starts happening, oh, but they're the one, they're the one, you're, you're in bondage. It's not in the Bible. Don't mix culture with the Bible. God gave you a brain. <laughs> so here we go. I'm closing, guys, here. Yeah? And I hope this helps you. It's tough. Don't get me wrong. It's tough to be single. But if you jump into a relationship before you're ready, you're going to have a problem. Singleness is a gift. And if you view it as a gift, you'll be able to maximize it. Find yourself so you can be your best. And when you are your best, you can bring your best to a relationship to bring the best out of them. Singleness can either be a passport or a prison. You can either want someone to bail you out or you can maximize it in trouble. Singleness means you have all the time in the world to serve God. When you serve God and you're running as fast as you can, that's when you discover the equal yoke. You were not called to date. And if you're dating, date with the intention of marriage. Amen. Amen. Honestly speaking, I want you guys to go home and meditate on that. Yeah, I really do. Please don't hop into relationships just because you feel like it. May, may, may go into relationships based on sober decisions. Remember, you have to discover your purpose first. Why are you here on this earth to glorify God? And the person you get with must help you and aid you glorify God in the way that you do. Yeah? It's important. So please, go home and meditate upon this message. For those of you that aren't in a relationship, I'm not discouraging you. I'm encouraging you to find yourself first. Amen. Relationships are beautiful. I want to see all of you married. Don't get twisted. But I want you to marry well. Amen. And so I'm going to say something before we close. I want to help you. Yeah. To the women inside here, I want to treat you like my little sisters. I want to, I want to guard you from any guy that's trying to be nonsense. Yeah. I'm not a controlling guy at all. But if you would allow me to vet these men, I will do so. Happy. Man, then. This is a call for you guys to come forward. If you're serious about becoming the best man that you can be, getting rid of your debt, becoming a leader, I'm setting something up for you guys. At the end of this sermon series, I'm gonna call you to come forward. If you are serious about living a godly life and becoming a leader in a home, I'm gonna need you guys to stand up. If you don't want that level of accountability, stay sat, I understand. Can you all stand to our feet, please?